Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. Today we have the spellbinding Kate Forsyth who wrote a first novel at the age of seven and has now sold more than a million books worldwide. Her most recent book, Beauty in Thorns, is a reimagining of Sleeping Beauty set amongst the passions and scandals of the pre-Raphaelites. Other novels include Bitter Greens, which won the 2015 American Library Association Award for Best Historical Fiction, and then The Wild Girl, the story of the forbidden romance behind the Grimm Brothers fairy tales, named one of Australia's favourite 15 novelists. Kate has a doctorate in fairy tale studies and is an accredited master storyteller with the Australian Guide of Storytellers. Kate shares with us some of her greatest lessons in life, which were to be patient and take the time that is needed to do good work, to have faith in herself and the story she is telling, and to have courage in every aspect of her life. Kate is also a direct descendant of Charlotte Waring Atkinson, the author of the first book for children ever published in Australia. Now let's get ready to tune into this one inspirational woman. Enjoy. So welcome to I Am Woman Project. We have Kate Forsyth with us today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So before we got on the show, Kate was just telling me how she's a little bit jet lag and she has just landed from her trip uh, away where she was uh, enjoying the sunshine in New York. So tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh, it was beautiful. Um, So I was just traveling in the U.S. for a couple of weeks. Um, I was over there for the Historical Novel Society Conference. Um, So I was teaching and talking, telling stories um, doing just a little mini tour for my different publishers over there and then just having meetings with my agents in New York. I had a lovely lunch, gorgeous restaurant overlooking the park. It was gorgeous. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Not like here in uh, winter grey Melbourne where <laughs> I'm sitting here with about five or six layers just to keep uh, some heat on me. So, Kate, for our listeners, let's unpack Kate Forsyth a little bit. What's your story? Um, Well, I've always wanted to be a writer. I've never wanted to be anything else. My mother says that I was writing stories, uh, you know, from the time that I could first hold a pencil. I wrote my first novel when I was only seven, and I've never stopped since. I'm always working on something. Um, I try and write every single day um, if I can. I've pretty much made my living from my writing right from the time that I finished my first degree. So I worked as a journalist. I've worked in as a magazine editor. I've worked in in PR and and publicity um, until my first novel was published, which um, happened when I was thirty years old. Um, I've since um, you know I've been a full time writer ever since. I've had about about forty books published all up, which is quite a lot in twenty years. Wow, that's huge! I'm curious, what was your first book at the age of seven? Um, well, it was handwritten in a school exercise book. It was called Runaway. It's a story of uh, a brother and a sister who ran away from home um, from their nasty aunt and uncle and had all sorts of adventures on their way to find their nice auntie who offered them a home. 
it's very much like Ina Blyton, who was my favorite author at the time. <laughs> wow. So there wasn't, uh, it wasn't related to your own experience? Oh, no, of course not. Mm. But I'm a novelist. I, I'm, I don't write memoir. I write novels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And 40 books, now that's an achievement because we have had a few uh, writers on the show and we have, uh, I don't think we've ever had somebody that's written 40 books though. Thank you so much. Well, my 40 books include picture books and early readers, a collection of essays, a collection of poetry um, and various other types of um, of books as well as novels. I've, I'm just about to have a, a collection of short stories published and um, I've been working with an, with an illustrator on a collection of retold fairy tales um, called Vasilisa the Wise and other tales of brave young women. So not all of it is, um, you know, what I'm what I'm I'm best known for, which are for my historical novels for adults, which are really quite big, large books. So some of them are really quite small as well. So you were saying before you write every day. What inspires you uh, to write every day? Um, well, writing is is what I do. You know, writing is as natural to me as breathing. It would be more unnatural for me not to write every day. Um, and if I ever have a lot on my plate and I'm very, very busy and I don't get any time any time for writing, I can really feel it in myself. I can feel that sense of being of being you know frustrated and unhappy and longing just to be able to get some writing done. Mm. So where do you actually get your inspiration from though? Is it where do you actually does it does it, does it come to you? Is it is mm. it something that you is a conversation? Like I know for me, I love to write. I write every Sunday, but for me I have these little notebooks and it's minor my ideas come from conversation. Well, um, I get asked this question a lot and the truth of the matter is is that inspiration can come from anywhere. I also have been inspired by conversations with people. I might be inspired because I've read something that fascinates me. Some of my ideas come to me in dreams. Some of them just come, you know, when my mind has drifted off into a daydream and suddenly this idea just kind of drops into my lap and it's just such a wonderful gift. Um, sometimes I need to go in search of inspiration. Sometimes it comes without me actually wanting it or even needing it and the idea just suddenly, it, you know, electrifies my imagination. Um, each book needs more than one source of inspiration and so each book um, it's a matter of trusting in the story and knowing that the answers will come, um, just waiting for the the right zing of inspiration. So when you say you search for inspiration, where do you search for your inspiration? Uh, well, many of my books are historical novels for adults and so they're very research intensive. I have to do a great deal of reading and research before I start the novel Sometimes um, I have a strong idea what my novel's about, but other times um, I'm actually searching through books and archives and, you know, following a trail of clues um, and discovering my story as I go along. It really depends on the book and what it is that I actually need. Um, it's each, each book is different and works in a slightly different way. Mm, I love that. And you also mentioned that sometimes your inspiration comes from your dreams. Do you actually keep a dream journal? Well, I keep a journal yeah. and I record my dreams in my journal, but I also record what I'm reading, what I'm wearing, what I'm eating, what the weather's like, who I've met, conversations I've had, interesting quotations that I hear or stumble across, um, anything at all really. It all gets written down in my journal. I've kept a diary since I was 11 years old. Um, I write in it nearly every day, and so I now have about 60 volumes um, all kept on a shelf in my diary, um, I'm sorry, in my study. Um, anything at all goes in there, anything that catches my attention or which I find interesting or unusual, um, I just write it down and keep it kind of um, in the one place. When I get to the end of every single diary, I go through and read through um, and anything that is of importance to me, I then keep in what I call an ideas book. Um, this is just ideas for novels. I get more ideas for novels than I could ever write, uh, but I do like to keep them, you know, keep a track of them. 
just in case I ever am short of an idea, I can go back to my ideas book and who knows what I'll find in there. That's a great problem to have, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. have too much content. I love that. So yeah. do you ever uh, experience writer's block? Um, it depends what you mean by writer's block. So for most people, when they think of writer's block, they see it as it is you know, depicted in most movies where you have an author, usually a white man, sitting at a desk with a typewriter in front of him and he stares down there and then he types a few words and he rips the paper out and throws it at the waste paper basket and then does it all again. Um, and, you know, for most people, writer's block is like a deep psychological block that keeps you from writing for a long, long period of time. And so, no, I've never experienced writer's block like that. And to tell you the truth, I don't think most professional authors actually do experience that. There will be times when I don't feel like writing, I'm tired or I've been working really, really hard and I feel a little bit wrung out and I need a, t- a little bit of time to let my imagination lie fallow for a while. Um, but I will keep on writing and working and reading and thinking and, and daydreaming and studying all the things that lead to writing. Um, and sometimes I'm a bit stuck in my book. I'm not quite sure how to solve a problem. But like all you know, professional writers, I have a whole series of ways to overcome those kind of short-term blockages. Um, I either write a different scene where, which is more, fo- um, more fully realised in my imagination or I do some brainstorming exercises or I go for a walk um, or I think about my problem just as I'm falling to sleep and hope that my subconscious would deliver the answer for me in the form of a dream. All of these are methods that I use all the time and they, and they usually come through for me. So when you actually uh, put it all together, you've done all your research, how do you map it all out? Do you create a storyboard? Like what's one of the things that you create or a technique that you use to uh, complete a book? Well, I don't storyboard because my books are far too large and complex um, and those are really quite, that's, that's really quite a simple planning tool. Um, I'm a notebooker which means that I keep a notebook of my creative process. Um, I fill it with um, pictures and I draw maps and I write myself lists of questions, things that need to be done, things I need to know. I create timelines and character outlines. Um, I I simply build the story brick by brick, um, finding each stone as I need it. Um, I try very hard uh, to uh, plan fairly carefully so I have some sense of how long the book needs to be and how many chapters I need in that book, how many scenes I therefore need to fill up the space. Um, Some, you know, some books, uh, you know, planning is easy and you follow your plan quite closely. With other books, you make a plan and then you discover so much more about your story that you throw out your original plan and make a new one. Um, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. It isn't a formula. It's a, a process of, of discovery and change. Um, with each book, it throws up new challenges, new problems that you need to find the, um, the solution for. Um, but I'm a pretty steadfast worker. Um, as I said, I tend, you know, when I'm working on a novel, I tend to work on it all day, every day. And I, I just simply write it word by word sentence by sentence, scene by scene, slowly and steadfastly building the story. And how long does it take you to complete a full book or a full novel? It depends on the length of the book and it depends um, how problematic the book is. So if I'm writing a children's book of around 30,000 words, if I really, really push myself, I could write that in three weeks but I would normally take about two to three months to write 30,000 words. And some books will be difficult and give me some problems and might take me a little bit longer, let's say four or five months. Um, One of my historical novels for adults is considerably longer. So we're talking about 150,000 words. Um, I normally give myself um, a year to 18 months. But again, sometimes a book takes longer and then I need to um, have an uh, an extension on my deadline for my publisher um, but it, it, if so it's only a matter of months I'm, I don't keep them waiting for years and years and years and they always know that I am very close to, to delivering when I do ask for a, an extension 
it's simply, um, you know, some books end up being quite a bit more complex or difficult in the research, um, and that takes a little bit longer. Once I got all my research done, I tend to write quite swiftly, and I have a strong sense of uh, my character's voice and the internal structure of the novel. Those are things, and the rhythm of the story, I think the rhythm is absolutely crucial, and I can't write the book until I know what kind of rhythm the story has. Those things, once I I have those things, then I find the writing quite fluid and swift and relatively easy. So I do a lot of the work before I write a single word. Mm, sounds that you do. I spend invest a lot of time and energy prior to actually writing. Mm. So Kate, you mentioned that you teach. So what exactly do you teach? Um, it depends who I'm teaching. Um, so generally I teach um, adults who wish to write. Um, sometimes I teach at, uh, at universities. Um, so when I travel overseas, I normally do one or two creative writing classes at a, a, a university. Sometimes I simply um, do so through, let's say, the New South Wales Writers' Centre or through, you know, Victorian writers, you know, you know some kind of writing organization that pays me to, to come in and do a full day workshop. Sometimes I do online courses through the Australian Society of Authors. Sometimes I teach in, in schools and libraries, depending on who wants me and what my schedule is at that time. I could teach full time because um, my classes are always very much in demand. So I have a very strict limit to how much teaching I do. I try to do no more than one or two um, sessions a month. When you were saying creative writing, because it sounds to me you very much go with the flow, is there, because it's depending on what you're writing, um, is there a formula that you follow? Um, it really depends, again, what you mean by formula. All stories have a, have a basic imperative. All stories um, tell the story the story of um, a character or group of characters who are in search of th- of something, who want something, that have some kind of objective or problem that needs to be achieved or solved. Um, and so that's a basic formula of all stories. You know, somebody wants something that is hard to get. You follow them on their journey to either get or not get what they want. Um, I My most popular course is teaching people how to plot uh, because I am, um, you know, I plan quite carefully and I think you can nearly always tell a story that has not been planned properly. It, um, it's lacking in focus, it's lacking in rhythm and energy, it kind of, you know, falls apart, has plot holes in it and the author sometimes gets themselves into a muddle they can't get themselves out of. And so people find you know, my basic course on how to plan a novel and what plotting is to be extremely useful to them. Um, And that's the one I I get asked to teach most often. Um, But I get asked to teach all sorts of things. You know, I get asked to teach, you know, how to build a character. Um, You know, Pace and Suspense is another very popular workshop of mine. Um, You know, how to, you know, create suspense and maintain pace. Um, Really, it's, it's, uh, simply a matter, I think, of sharing with other people some of the lessons I've learned from all the mistakes that I've made in my own writing. I don't think I haven't. I don't think that there's a mistake I haven't made and learned from, really. I was about to ask you, Kate, through your writing journey, what has been some of those greatest lessons? Ah, oh, well, um, I think probably the one of the biggest lessons is to be patient. Uh, people are always rushing the writing uh, of their story and then rushing trying to get published. Um, they're not taking the time to plan properly, not taking the time to write and rewrite and rewrite and edit and rewrite and edit. Um, and they're not taking the time to let the story rest um, and grow properly. Um, if I was to think of what the um, other great lesson that I have learned is just simply to have faith in myself and in the story that I'm telling, to know that the answers will come to me in time, that I will be able to solve this problem and that I will be able to, um, you know, let the story be 
what it wants to be. Um, I'm also a big believer in the necessity of courage. Um, you know, writers need to be brave because you are opening yourself up to all kinds of, um, you know, criticisms that are sometimes quite hurtful and even harmful. Um, you need to be brave about what you're writing about. You know, some people um, find it difficult to write the really powerful, confronting scenes, um, and yet those are the most important scenes in the book. People are afraid to be to try and be published because they're afraid of, of rejection, and people are afraid of um, not being good enough, of failing. Um, well, that, I think, is the one thing that's always going to hold you back. You need to be... You know, acknowledge those fears, but say to yourself, well, I know that failure is almost in, entirely necessary in the act of creation because what I hope to achieve and what I'm likely to achieve will never be the same thing. But it is so worth trying. It is so worth throwing everything that you've got into the task at hand, trying to do the very best job that you can and then taking pride in what you've actually achieved. Um, if, you know, the thing that I find that holds most aspiring authors back is, is that kind of fear. And I wish that if I could just give everyone one gift, it would just to learn to have courage and to have faith in themselves. And I think that, you know, it's just an, another interview just uh, the other week that we were saying that to have courage, you have to walk through the fear. Courage won't exist without fear. So it's that's like right. feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah, that's exactly right. And also the fear, um, you know, the anxiety that we feel, you know, writing is an art. And so all we have to guide us is our, in, our intuition. And our intuition speaks to us through our body. And so when we have that kind of knot of anxiety in the pit of the stomach, when we lie awake, you know, worrying about whether our story is working or not, or whether we've done the right thing, made the, not, the right narrative choices, that's our intuition speaking to us. And we need to learn to listen to it and, and say, well, have I made a mistake? Have, you know, could I do this better? Um, you know, what is the story trying to tell me through this, this feeling of anxiety? Um, you need to, to be able to separate uh, your own personal anxiety and the way it's holding you back from the anxiety that comes from your intuition telling you that, that you're, you've actually gone off track and you're doing something wrong and you need to listen and overcome those particular problems in the story. And I think that is really, really important to understand that because um, we have no other way of knowing. Um, our intuition speaks to us through our bodies Mm. And and we have to listen, learn to listen. Absolutely, I'm right there with you, Kate. I I don't know how many writing courses I've um, been involved in, and you know, there's they put so much structure uh, around. This is how you should do it. This is what you should not should do, and so forth. And I'm very big on intuition. I dance with my writing. I don't have a structure. It's what comes through me, and I allow mm -hmm. it to come through me. Uh, one thing I did want to ask you, you said you it's what's really important is to rewrite, edit, rewrite, edit. How often or how many times, should I say, are you rewriting and editing? As many times as is needed. Uh, you know, some scenes need very little work. Um, you know, they seem to come out pretty much as I hoped they would. And other scenes uh, need to be constantly, constantly, you know, rewritten to make better. Um, I... I tend to uh, look over every morning when I, I sit down to work. I read what I wrote the day before and then I give it a bit of a cut and a polish. I might extend it. I might deepen it. I might um, see a few little small mistakes I've, I've made. And so I spend an hour or two kind of polishing up what I've already written. But it will be done again and again and again and again. And then when I've actually got a complete first draft, I undertake a whole series of quite, um, uh, you know, massive edits then. I try and read every single chapter as a, a separate entity. I look at my chapter beginnings, my chapter endings. I um, highlight all the dialogue and read only the dialogue in each chapter. I look very strongly at what kind of rhythm I'm trying to create and whether or not the scene fits into that rhythm. 
um, I I really do spend quite a bit of time working on on the novel at that kind of later stage. Mm. So, Kate, what I'd like to uh, uh, get into is pain points. We are uh, as uh, uh, business owners, writers, we all have pain points. What would be your biggest pain point that you deal on a day-to-day basis as a writer? Um, for me, it's the multitudes of um, emails and kind of social media messages coming from all different sources and it's making sure that I'm not so overwhelmed by those that I don't have a full-time answering emails. I get a lot of requests from people wanting uh, me to teach them or mentor them or help them in some way, and um, they all need to be answered, and then they all take, you know, I, I feel bad that I can't help people as much as I wish that I'd like to. I have to put my own family first and my own writing first, and so I've actually, over the last few years, have put in place a few general rules for myself about how I manage things. I try, um, you know, I, I I can't spend all day answering emails, so I try and answer the key ones in an hour every single day. Anything that's not key has to wait until a day when I have less emails. Um, I'm quite careful about social media because, as you all know, it can, it can suck up a lot of time. Um, and, and so, again, I have quite strict rules about when and how much I do. Um, the administrative work, um, sending out invoices, um, updating my blog, doing things like that. I actually have a personal assistant who, who manages a, a lot of those things for me to make sure that I have time to write. Um, these, it, it, you know, writing is the a joyful process for me and I'm always happy writing. It's a lot of the other work that goes around it that uh, – you know, makes things difficult for me. And so as far as possible, I try and manage those so that they don't end up sucking all the joy out of the task. Mm, I yeah. see. So so um, are you saying that you only invest one hour a day uh, on emails? Um, I wish. That's what I try to. What I do is in the mornings I only answer those um, key emails and then I start everything else for later quite often I'll answer them again at night but I do a lot of my research at night as well and I I have other writing tasks so um any email that hasn't been answered by the end of the week I tend to do um quite a bit of work admin work on the weekend um I try and have one complete day off my um off my screens um and I must say as well that uh, like I get a multitude of emails that are extremely similar to a multitude of other emails and so I have standard responses. Mm, I love that. Thank you so so much for your email. I'm afraid that I do not offer a free manuscript assessment service. Here is uh, a few links that may be of use to you. Yours sincerely, Kate Forsyth. Mm, Love that. Love that. (laughs) Very clever, but it, it's it's true. It's it's one of those things that email, social media can d- take you away from the very thing that you need to do. Where it's it's you're working with your strengths. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, I actually think that uh, we are, we are hit with such a multitude of you know different stimulants and different um, things demanding our attention now. Um, I think you need you really need to clear your airspace and be very focused and disciplined about what it is that you are actually doing and what you are here for. Um, I blog a lot, but if I'm really busy, if I'm writing, I'm quite happy to let my blog go for a few weeks until I've got time to pick it up again. It's not um, my, it's not my primary source of, of, of income and it's not my primary job. And so if it's, it's taking up too much of my time, um, I simply let it rest for a while and then – catch up with it again later. Uh, there are many things that I do which, um, you know, such as teaching or mentoring, that I, I have to keep very, very strict rules on. Um, I only mentor one person a year, no more, no, no matter how often I'm asked um, and how much money I'm offered to do it. Um, until I finish with, with, with the person I'm mentoring, I will not take on another one. 
Mm, I like that. You have uh, very um, strong boundaries. So, Kate, one of the pain points that some writers talk about is finding a publisher. What would be one of those uh, or an an advice that you would give those writers that uh, has those kind of pain points with finding a publisher? I know it's difficult. I mean, I hear hear this a lot and I know there are so many people out there who – who love to write and are longing to be published, um, the best advice that I can give you is to be patient, to do the work that is necessary to bring your work to the highest possible standard, to find um, uh, you know people who can help you stay on track and keep you focused and disciplined, um, to spend the time planning properly and also editing properly. They're the two areas of writing that, people are most likely not to pay attention to. Um, In Australia, we have, um, uh, you know, literary agents who will help you find a publisher. I would really advise um, trying to find a literary agent because they not only help you find a publisher but they help you manage your career and help you, um, you know, build a long-term career. To survive as a writer, you really need to um, produce regularly and be very reliable about what you are producing. Um, I mean, I would not, I would not get too cynical or or disillusioned with the industry. Every publisher I know is just the loveliest, loveliest person, and they work so hard, um, and they have, um, you know, they're, they're so inspired and lovely. You know, you know, books and reading so much, and they're all looking all the time to discover someone new. It's you know, all writers were once aspiring writers. All of us had to go through the, you know, running the gauntlet, trying to be published, trying to learn how to do our job better, and all of us somehow overcame you know those obstacles. So just keep keep the faith in yourself. Keep on writing. Don't give up too easily. A lot of people give up uh, almost just before things are about to break for them because they just get exhausted. So if you really, really care about this and this is really an important dream for you, just keep the faith and keep on trying. Mm, It's how bad do you want it, right? Yeah. And, I mean, nowadays there are so many different Roots to publication. Once upon a time, it was it's, it, it was much more difficult in the past than it is now. There were all sorts of wonderful new technologies and wonderful new ways of getting published. And so, ex- explore those possibilities, you know, before b- before you give up. So, Kate, what do you think is the number one reason that most writers fail to succeed? Um, I think that. Uh, Everything I've just been saying is part of it. I think that they lose faith in themselves. I think they allow their ego to have too large a place in the role. And by that I mean their fears, their anxieties, their self-doubts. You know, they they get wrapped by these negative emotions. Um, Instead of simply putting aside their own feelings and focusing in on the story. You know, the the writer should be invisible in, in the story. Um, the reader should not even really remember that the writer is there. And it's, you know, the story should be paramount. Turning the story in the best possible way that you know how is your only job. And so every time you find yourself, you know, wrapped with self doubt and fear, you're actually putting your ego in the way of your job, which is to tell the story. Mm. So, Kate, if we go back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, look, pretty much what I've been saying all along. Um, when I was quite a young writer, I first tried to get published when I was 16 years old um, and I sent in one of my handwritten manuscripts, written, you know, longhand in a school exercise book. I sent it into a publisher um, and was so so hopeful that I would be published. Um, Unsurprisingly enough, um, they didn't accept the manuscript, but they sent me a very beautiful rejection letter, a very kind one. I think they knew I was still only a kid. Um, And one of the things that they said in it was, you clearly have talent 
keep on writing and I'm sure you'll be published one day. And so those those three words, keep on writing, have become a bit of a mantra for me. Um, I just, no matter what happens, you know, whether I feel like I've been knocked down or I've been hurt or I I find I'm struggling with the ba- with the life balance of keeping my family and my writing and and my career from spinning out of control. I just I just tell myself just keep on writing and the answer will come to you and it always has. So that's my advice to my younger self, keep on writing. I love that, keep on writing. So uh, Kate, we always ask our woman of inspiration to pick one word that best describes her personal brand. So what would be that one word for you? I actually agonised over this question when you warned me that you were going to ask it of me because finding one word to describe yourself is quite, quite difficult. So I actually um, went to my social media and I said, help me, help me. <laughs> and everyone gave me the most wonderful, wonderful um, suggestions. And so I picked the one that I had actually already thought of in my own head that many other people also said, and that was the word spellbinding. I love um, that. And I love the fact that you went to social media to ask <laughs> because it's true sometimes we're not aware of what our personal brand is until uh, we get the feedback. Well, it was it was as much that um, in a way we uh, – so taught not to, um, you know, build ourselves up, not to boast about ourselves. And so it's quite an interesting exercise to say, well, if I was to look at myself and my work and my and my career with clear and honest eyes, how would I describe myself? And um, that was the word that I, that was one of the words that I had come up with on my own and then to ask other people and to see that same word being repeated again and again and again and the pleasure it gave me to know that that's what people thought about my writing that was what helped me choose that one particular word for myself so thank you Catherine for Mm. helping me see myself clearly So thank you for taking the time and energy to uh, discover such a wonderful word, spellbinding. (laughs) I love it. So the other thing that we ask our woman of inspiration as we wrap up the show is to leave our our listeners with three shiny golden nuggets. So what are those three shiny golden nuggets that you would like to leave for our listeners today? Well, the first would be to trust in yourself and your dreams. Um, I... I think that this is incredibly important um, and it, it it always makes me sad when I meet people who have given up on their dreams. So the first one is trusting yourself and your dreams. The second one is to be kind to yourself and to those around you. Um, everyone deserves a little kindness in their life, a little bit of loving, even yourself. And my third shining golden nugget is to have the courage to be true to yourself. Mm, I love all three of them. So, Kate, how would our listeners or what's the best place for our listeners to find you? Well, I'm very easy to find. If you just uh, Google my name, Kate Forsyth, um, you will find my website, which is www.kateforsyth.com.au. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm, I'm very active on all of them. Um, and my email is, uh, is easily found on my website. And so, uh, you know, I'm very open to people emailing me. I'm not hard to find at all. Mm, hence all the emails. Yes. I love it. Exactly. So- <laughs> so, Kay, I can't thank you enough for your time and energy and especially the fact that you've just landed today in your jet lag and you've still come on to the show. So thank you so very much for your time and energy. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au 
and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.